So as I said, one of the things that we try to do at SEMA is to promote dialogue. And one of our key objectives over the past few years has been to try to promote a dialogue between media development, uh, that is, as a concept and also as a field, um, with some of its adjacent uh, fields, such as governance and development. Um, we think today's discussion is going to be a really strong illustration of why this dialogue is so vitally important. Uh, on the topic today, specifically of civic engagement and media, we're looking at how civic engagement that may be conflictual, characterized by protest and antagonisms, um, can at times evolve towards dialogue and consensus uh, and hopefully towards resolutions that ultimately deepen democracy uh, in law uh, and in the minds of uh, citizens. Uh, I realize that civic engagement today seems to be mostly going in the wrong, in the opposite direction, uh, and that media has been uh, and the challenges facing media systems are central, in fact, um, to the challenges that are pushing civic engagement uh, away from dialogue and towards more uh, greater conflict and greater antagonism. Um, and that's, that's why today's discussion really is so relevant and, uh, and why this dialogue between media development, between those thinking about media, those thinking about development, those thinking about governance, um, it's so vital for us to talk, uh, talk with one another. Uh, there is a lot of knowledge on this stage about what turns the tide uh, from uh, conflict to dialogue uh, from many different perspectives. So uh, I think that we will leave today, uh, in spite of living in troubling times, uh, with uh, a sense of hope that we actually have a great deal of knowledge amongst us for uh, addressing these really tremendous challenges. Uh, so with that, I'll introduce our uh, illustrious uh, panelists. Uh, Ivana Bajdovic is the Associate uh, Director uh, for Europe here at the National Endowment for Democracy and for more than a decade has been uh, working to support citizen engagement uh, and democratization in that region, um, so has real wealth of experience. Uh, Naomi Hussain, a research fellow and a former colleague of mine at the Institute of Development Studies, um, in the last decade has uh, been looking particularly at the political and social responses to the food price spikes. Now, as many of you are aware, the reaction to the rising cost of food around the world has uh, kindled in some places protests and riots, uh, but in other places, um, you know, has uh, allowed citizens, civil society, governments, uh, the private sector to come together to try to find solutions to this uh, for the common good. Uh, so Naomi can speak uh, from that perspective to uh, what shifts the tide uh, between uh, antagonism and uh, dialogue. Uh, we also have uh, Tara Sussman Pena, senior uh, technical advisor at IREX. Uh, who has uh, been a really important figure in our field of media development for many years and um, recently has uh, been the lead author in a brand new strategy, which she'll talk about today for IREX, uh, which is one of the leading implementers of media development. Uh, and this new strategy is really looking to cross boundaries um, to engage much more strongly uh, with uh, partners working on governance uh, and development um, and pushing um, their efforts uh, downstream, if you will, not just towards objectives related to media, but towards objectives related to citizen engagement and development. Um, so really timely uh, contribution from IREX. Um, and finally, we've got Marco uh, Larizza, the Senior Public Sector Specialist at the World Bank. Uh, and uh, recently one of the authors of the World Bank, uh, the World Development Report. Uh, Marco uh, authored Chapter 8 and a spotlight on media that's associated with that chapter, looking precisely at citizen engagement. 
Uh, and uh, as uh, many of you will know, this World Development Report has been received uh, quite well and as, you know, quite an ambitious, uh, setting out quite an ambitious vision uh, for governance. Uh, governance and law, and the law is the title. Marco has a, has a copy there. Uh, and and th there are a few outside. IREX is also, IREX has also uh, left a few copies of their report. So please um, pick up a copy of that on the way out. So to jump right into it, uh, we're going to start with, with Marco. As I was saying, the, the World Development Report, which I've just learned this year, 2017, is the most popular, at least by measure of downloads. 90,000 downloads in just the four, in four months since it was released. Uh, so that's another indication of, uh, of the appetite um, for this topic at the moment. Uh, and as I said, this, this flagship report is uh, looking at uh, s summarizes what we know about uh, citizen engagement, and particularly Chapter 8 uh, looks into the key channels that direct civic engagement towards positive and lasting change. So, Marco, if you could start uh, briefly giving us a little bit of context about what it is that we know about these channels, and particularly the role that media plays uh, in, this, uh, in this process. Thank you. It's uh, is it working? Yeah. So it's a big pleasure to be here, and um, uh, let's get straight into the issue so that we don't waste any time. Let me start by saying that with the World Development Report, you know, for you know, those of you that have been uh, the opportunity to read it or at least to be curious about it, we try to uh, to bring a contribution on. Uh, what uh, might be the opportunity to change situations where uh, citizens don't have a voice or the um, preferences might not be reflected in the way that policies uh, are decided, uh, designed and implemented. And uh, there is an entire literature that we capture in the report that says that change is difficult and so there is a reason why uh, a lot of mm, development outcomes are different about countries and sometimes ineffective policies are persistent. But what we try to say is that there are actually ways in which change is possible. And uh, this, uh, in a sense, differentiate reports from other studies which basically tells you have to wait for 200 years between uh, before your country develops or becomes uh, Denmark. I mean, we try to say that even in the short term, countries can adapt. And citizens play a role in that and there are different channels. And um, uh, the channels, I mean, there is an entire chapter dedicated to that, indicate how uh, citizens through their own organization can change incentives of decision making, reshapes preferences and also reduce barriers of entry, which by that we mean that how certain actors that were previously excluded mm, can enter into the policy arena and basically have a say into the decisions that are made. Now, the media are all strang strongly connected to this process because media can help uh, citizens to organize, uh, they can reduce information asymmetries, make information available, so they can help in all these three entry points, in changing incentives, in reshaping preferences and, uh, um, and uh, reducing f barriers of entries for actors or issues. They can bring to the table issues that were previously excluded. Uh, so then we can, I'm sure, say more on that and get into the ways through which media intervene into these uh, uh, processes through these different channels. And um, the, um, maybe we can just say that uh, we also look at the, the fact that the media might also be uh, constrained to change. So there is uh, some sort of an agnostic view of the, the role of the media that can be an agent of change, but by being captured by powerful interests and by being owned by certain groups might also undermine change. So this is something that we try to show in the report, and I'm happy to get into this as the conversation goes along. Great. Do you want to say, uh, you've brought one slide with you uh, yes. on, on the, the framework. Uh, do you want to say a couple? Yeah, words maybe, uh, I mean, I don't know how many of you actually read the report or been exposed to it, so uh, how, uh, how much you should take for granted. But suppose this is the first time you hear about the, the World Development Report. There is one visual that basically try to say is what, what is new about that and what is new about the way that we look at governance. Uh, governance has usually been 
uh, defined as you know systems of mm, rules and procedures through which uh, uh, decisions are made and uh, and uh, executed. We take a different view. We say that governance is a process. It's a process through which state and non-state actors interact into a space which we call the policy arena and uh, in a system which is uh, uh, in a system of formal informal rules which is shaped and shapes power. What, what does it mean by that? Is that when people interact and to make decisions and to express their preferences, not everybody has equal power. And this power asymmetries determines what decisions are made and what uh, preferences are then translated into, uh, into the design of certain policies. So, but this visual basically shows that the development outcomes can empower certain actors and give them the ability to mm, shape the decision-making process in a way that can change the rules and so also allow them to have a say in the formal, uh, formal, formal processes that then determine who is in and who is out in the policy arena. So it's a, uh, it's uh, you know there is a, you know there's a lot of endogeneity. It's a, it's a, it's a circular mm, process. But we by that we want to say that understanding processes, understanding who is in and who is out, how certain actors are excluded or included, and how uh, collective action can be organized in a way to help certain players to, mm, to, to enter into the policy arena, that is important because it affects development outcomes. So we have an instrumental view of governance, which is important not only in its own rights, but for the instrumental value that can have in making uh, policies more effective and thereby have an effect in development outcomes. So this is probably the most important visual of the entire report. Great. <laughs> so governance, fundamentally important for development outcomes. Yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, this is not new, but what we try to show in the report is uh, how this linkages work uh, historically. Great. All right, that's a good segue uh, to Tara, uh, uh, Tara, excuse me. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, IREX has unveiled this, uh, this new strategy. Um, perhaps you could just say a few words uh, to us about what this strategy is about, why it's such a tremendous shift for IRX and uh, particularly what it means for IRX um, to be using media development as a way of uh, supporting these wider channels of governance and all of that implies for uh, downstream for development in people's lives. So, um, thank you I should say first mm -hmm. for saying any remarks. It's really a pleasure to be here um, and I'm really excited particularly with the kind of diverse group that we have here. I think that's great um, and very needed moving forward. Um, so if you don't mind, I, I, I'll just give a bit of background as why, you know, why did we do this and why did we do this now? Um, IRX has been around for um, almost 50 years actually and we've done our media work over the last two decades and we had um, in the mid 90s kind of solidified what I call a holistic media sector approach to media development. So that was um, during a time when it was pretty easy to say like this is what the media sector is, right? We said that it had four important pillars, journalistic professionalism, um, legal rules and norms. Can you check Did your... I not turn on my... Yeah. Okay. Were people catching that in the background? Sorry, I was uh, listening and not paying attention to my cues over there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was so excited, <laughs> I just went running forward. So I'll, I'll just do a tiny backup. I won't back up to the beginning. What I was starting to say was that, basically, why do we do this now? And um, we felt that with um, so much going on right now in the world in terms of just incredible technological transformation, with a lot of kind of, as you said, things going in the wrong direction in terms of uh, economic and political norms, that this was a good time to take a look at our um, holistic media sector approach, which we developed in the mid-90s after the fall of the Soviet Union and we had as a model the a media sector which had what we called four pillars. So journalistic professionalism, um, supporting institutions, um, legal and regulatory norms, and what am I missing, business management. So and the idea was that we would through these four pillars we would support media outlets and the media outlets would produce good useful content and give it to the audience and sort of like there was a, a cycle that made sense. And um, it's not that this has completely gone away. Of course it hasn't, but as you know, I don't need to tell you, a lot has happened in the, in the intervening two decades, right? So 
And IREX's reaction to these changes has mostly been to kind of take on new things or take away bits and pieces of our approach, but, th but without really taking a step back and saying, are we still framing things in the right way? So as an example um, of, of new types of things, um, a, a lot of it related to new technology. So for example, integrated security, digital, physical, psychosocial security training that we do for journalists and now for activists as well has become a big part of what we do. It didn't really fit kind of exactly into this four pillar approach. So a lot of these kind of changes made us think that it was time to kind of step back and say, what's the right, um, what's the right framing here? Um, so I guess I, I, I wanted to emphasize again that we, this does not mean that we're leading, leaving media behind. Um, I made this, uh, <laughs> I've made this uh, some version of a presentation about this to a, you know, a group of media outlets that we work with and I know that the first sentence there was like a <gasps> sharp intake of breath. That does not mean that we think that professional media is dead or anything like it at all. We still believe that it's very important. Um, we still support it. However, um, the system is much more complicated and has changed a lot. So. Um, we know that, for example, a lot of other actors are producing journalistic quality content in addition to just professional journalists. Um, we know that there's a blurred lines between the audience and the media. And sort of all of these things, um, they continue to change and we know that things are not going back to the mid-90s. So we figured it was time to start rethinking, um, rethinking how we're doing everything. Um, and we started with, so as I mentioned, you know, IREX is, um, IREX is a development organization that's been around for almost 50 years. We do media, but we also work in strengthening civil society institutions. We also work in strengthening education. Um, we work with leadership. We work with youth. So it was also time to start to pull all these things together and kind of knowledge from across the other work that we've been doing. Um, in the end, really, our focus is, is is information, but it's because we value people, right? We prioritize people, and so it's information so that people can help drive their own development. And so that was where um, we, through a long process, came up with an idea and kind of a framework around what we call vibrant information. Yes, and so I, I guess I'll just talk um, now just about this, this piece at the end. So these are the two pieces that we do, and maybe I'll have a chance to talk about la a bit later, but this is what we're calling vibrant information um, Vibrant information systems. So what do I mean by vibrant information? Um, the first piece is content, content that matters, right? So we believe that fact-based information, informative information is a public good um, and that we need political freedom, political skills in order to be able to create this content. Information should be inclusive of all types of people. It should be uh, inclusive of many types of platforms, right, on a variety of topics. Um, it should include opinion as well, but opinion marked as opinion, right? Not opinion marketed as something else. Um, this means reporting on different levels, right? So the hyperlocal, the local, the national, the international. Um, and an another important piece about accountability, that it may be that civil society organizations are producing journalistic content, but they should be accountable to that content. All information actors should be. The next piece is a focus on multiple channels, right? So it's more about access to that information, right? We believe very strongly that information needs to flow freely um, and that that supports better development and governance outcomes. And the evidence, I think, is very much in, in the favor of that. Um, so this means um, supporting institutions, media regulation, all of that should be supporting free flow of information. So when you look at the first two areas, I would say that's probably where IREX has focused on the most historically, at least in terms of how we talked about and thought about how we framed our work. Um, but now we're also focusing on what we're calling dynamic engagement. Um, and this means thinking a lot more about what happens when people and information interact, right? So as we know from our own personal experiences, right, information, uh, the way I'm thinking about it now is like information is not a shovel, that you give me a shovel, I try and dig a hole. It's a lot more complicated than that, right? I may believe or may not believe the information that you tell me, or perhaps it sort of helps me make some kind of meaning about my life, or helps me relate to a group, or not relate to a group, right? There's a whole bunch of negotiations that people go through with information before they use it for something or don't use it for something, right? So we're making a commitment to try and understand that better. Um, even though we know we won't be able to understand it perfectly. And a big piece of that is people's ability to discern information. So be able to discern fact from fiction, be able to, un to discern when they're having an emotional reaction to something that may be a manipulation. 
Um, and it's, uh, the other piece I want to say about dynamic engagement is the piece about access, right? So it's one thing to have information there and be able to access it, but do people really understand you know, what, what it means, right? So do they really understand how to, just because I have a computer, do I understand how to use it? Do I understand what the security implications might be? So that whole, um, that whole world, really, of engagement. And the last piece is transformative action. And um, I think my, uh, my own observation has been that um, in media development, we tend to say a lot that we believe that Journal uh, there should be good, um, useful journalistic content that provides people with important information that they need to make decisions to, you know, important decisions for their lives. Some version of that I've heard many, many, many times over the year. And I think probably there was always like an underlying assumption that that would lead to good action, that would lead to better development results. Perhaps there was like even, you know, a little secret thought or a secret, secret hope that that would happen. But we never, at least IREX never put it out there as saying like, actually, no, we're really invested in this and we're really committed to this. This is really important to us. Um, so part of our support is to that as well. And this could mean, um, it doesn't mean one thing necessarily, but of course we would focus on um, trying to bring about the positive types of actions, whether it's something like um, voting or whether it's something like creating a new business or challenging anti-democratic power structures. It could be a huge range of things. But what is the action that comes um, at the end of the, in of, of the information? Um, and then the last quick note I guess I'll say is just in terms of, of who we work with and how that's changing. I, I'm not sure that it's changing so much, but I think we're more sort of you know, taking it on, that we're not just working with media institutions anymore. We, we work with consumers, mm. information consumers. We work with, who are also creators, by the way. Um, we're, we work with libraries, actually, infomediaries, quite a bit. Um, we work with civil society organizations that are producing information and that are trying to communicate better with, um, with their audiences. Um, we work with think tanks. We work with sort of a whole range of actors. And so um, we really want to take that on as all being very important to this thing that we're calling vibrant information. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'd like to turn to uh, either Naomi uh, or Ivana. Uh, do you have any reaction to these presentations? Uh, does this resonate with what you guys have seen on the ground? You know, the World Bank putting governance in the media front and center in the, wor the World Development Report. Uh, IREX moving um, into uh, its strategy into this, m you know, many to many forms of communication and uh, delving deeper into m media's integration into the wider d governance environment. Uh, is this, these are all welcome changes, I presume, from uh, your perspective? Sure, I mean, yeah. I can start, and yes, absolutely welcome. They really resonated in, in, on both accounts. I think I'll start with the, uh, the World Development Report that I have to be quite honest is often difficult to relate to from someone coming from a democracy assistance grant-making organization. And uh, the little time that I had to read some of the parts of the report, and particularly those related to media and, and this uh, media box, uh, it was really like reading something completely unrelated to World Bank work, but related to what we do. And it was quite, it's, a, it's <laughs> totally a compliment. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, so it was really exciting um, to, to see that. And uh, I, I can understand why this report is one of your most popular, if not the most popular. And then, of course, uh, what Tara was just outlining um, really resonates with uh, the work that Ned does here, although, of course, uh, it looks like IREX has put a lot of thought into this, into analyzing this. And, um, and a lot of the, uh, the language that is used is something that we encounter in our work and, ex and, and examples of which we encounter on a daily basis, but maybe not think about it in the same way because we're not an implementer, but we are a grant-making institution. Um, we oftentimes are associated with support for civil society, first and foremost, uh, just like IREX is uh, first and foremost associated with media support. But in fact, it is actually a significant portion of the work that we do that is dedicated to media development. SEMA has done some excellent research in looking at these numbers and comparing um, our work in this field with some of the other grant-making organizations. And we do stand up there, I think, in the top three media assistance providers. And just to illustrate this with an example from the region that I've been covering for the last 12, year, 12 years here, in 2016, for example, the small portfolio of discretionary grants in Southeast Europe that amounts to roughly 4.2 million had uh, about 1.8 million in media assistance, which is 
roughly 40%. And this is just for grants that are directly related to media, uh, the type of work that, that Tara has outlined from um, supporting investigative reporting, direct media outlets, alternative media outlets. However, when you look at the rest of the portfolio and the civil society groups that are funded through this program, almost every single grant that we award has a media component that is there to assist in outreach and advocacy activities of the organizations that we fund. I do have to say, though, that what we've seen, at least from anecdotal evidence in the region that I cover, that the best results are produced when these elements come together. And I think uh, I'll quote a couple of the phrases that were used here uh, when, um, when these things are pulled together to create action together and um, when this civic engagement, when media helps civic engagement directed towards positive change. And I'd like to, if we have uh, you know, time to give an ex a really great example from Kosovo specifically, uh, in something that our colleagues at the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, a, a very dear and sister grant-making organization based out of New York, has dubbed the Triangle Approach, which is basically a synergy-building grant-making strategy that brings to get together uh, three different actors in civil society. On one hand, the think tank, who's uh, a think tank organization, that whose role is usually to provide research uh, policy proposals and recommendations. Then an advocacy grassroots, grassroots organization uh, whose role is to mobilize citizens and articulate their demands to the other members of, of this triangle. And then the third is, of course, a media organization that uh, either provides deeper investigative reporting on a particular issue or uh, helps to uh, spread this message out, or both, depends. Uh, and, and this approach is something that um, I think that we often encounter in our work, but it is that there are colleagues at RBF that have really have uh, trademarked this as, as a, as a grant-making strategy and uh, something that allows for citizens to be engaged in this demand for accountability with really great in, uh, input from the grassroots level and an inclusive process that brings together these three different elements in which each of the three organizations has their distinctive role. However, they inform each other's work, of course, and they build off of each other's work. And so, for example, um, one, one great example is uh, three organizations in Kosovo in 2007 bring coming together in um, uh, an attempt to try to better inform voters at the local level about what it is that their, their local government officials are doing or proposing to do if we're talking about the pre-electoral period. So specifically here, the three organizations was a think tank fund, Institute for Advanced Studies, GAP, uh, which was uh, analyzing budgets of, uh, in this particular case, ahead of local elections, of uh, electoral candidates, for mayoral candidates for upcoming elections. The second one was a Forum for Civic uh, Initiatives, Fitch, an, an advocacy organization that in this particular arrangement brought together local NGOs and mobilized citizens to come to what they dubbed town hall meetings with uh, elect uh, mayoral candidates. And the third one was a Kosovo branch of the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, which um, then uh, basically hosted these debates and uh, moderated these debates with the mayoral candidates and, and questions with citizens. And it was the first time really uh, in Kosovo and probably in the region as well that citizens had the opportunity to really delve deep into what were the proposed uh, platforms of these candidates and what were these people, should they be elected, uh, do with the monies that was at their disposal, which was really the citizens' money uh, first and foremost. And this is as far as this initial attempt could have gone, of course. But f uh, four years later, come new elections, what they've done is they've created a benchmark for uh, assessing the performance of these elected officials. And w uh, one of the immediate effects of this was that f there was a 50% turnover in political parties in power because citizens could finally hold the, uh, the elected officials elected in the previous elections accountable and either elect them or not elect them again to office. Um, there were a couple of other concrete examples just in the lab because we've also been funding uh, various elements of, of this approach since 2007 and uh, uh, we still continue to fund them. And just in the last year, for example, uh, some of the very specific development actually effects of, of this are that in uh, two municipalities, there was one school that was being built and two there on which construction has begun that was a promise made in previous elections, but without these mayoral debates and highlighting what some of these promises were, maybe wouldn't have happened because 
citizens often make these don't make these demands on their own individual capacity. Uh, or, for example, the fact that uh, a mayor of another municipality fulfilled his electoral promise and closed all the casinos in his municipality, which tends to be a big problem in, in Southeast Europe. So, and the examples go on, basically. Um, and I cumulatively, what, what this has resulted in is one of the most popular television programs in Kosovo, certainly. It has entertainment value, too. I think I saw uh, that sometimes these programs do have entertainment value in, in some countries in Latin America. Uh, for example, uh, what is really exciting and interesting about this program is that as these mayoral debates are happening live, the moderator is actually able to live uh, fact check what the mayoral candidates are saying because the people from the two other organizations, particularly the think tank, are online with her and as she's asking questions and receiving answers, she's able to immediately receive feedback from her colleagues and saying whether what they're saying is true and document, uh, documentable or not. And uh, so even though other, other television stations have tried to emulate this, it hasn't quite worked as well because I think there's a synergy between these three organizations, each of which provides a specific value. And I think it's a really a fantastic example of, of having different elements of civil society, including media, come together to push as a united force to create change, in this case at the local level. That's, that's terrific. Uh, I'd like to jump in, but I'm going to resist and, <laughs> uh, and ask Naomi to speak a little bit uh, from your perspective, and particularly your experience, as I mentioned earlier, um, about the reaction around the world to the food price spikes and what that says about all this. But I, w I do want to take things in a slightly different direction. Yeah. So if, you're, if you wanted to pick up on civil society, perhaps that's a good time to... Well, I, I want to talk about <coughs> uncivil society uh, as well. You her see, her so. example for me, um, it really brings back, it brings back the World Bank, some, something from the World Development Report. And that is in Chapter 8, it suggests that elections, political parties, citizen engagement and participatory spaces for, uh, you know, spaces for dialogue in and of themselves are not very effective unless each of those is strong. So they strengthen each other. And I think once upon a time, you might have thought of the media as another one of those citizen engagement pillars. But actually, I think increasingly what the media is and other knowledge brokers like think tanks, I'd maybe include them, are the glue, you know, are the it's like the interstitial. It, it's what you, helps these uh, channels for citizen engagement to work with each other. The media creates the knowledge that allow, you know, disseminates the knowledge that allows people to move between these spaces, frames the question in a way that allows uh, these different uh, institutions and channels to have that conversation. But so uh, that's, uh, I was going to pose that as uh, yeah, the media as the glue that binds these various channels. But, um, but why don't you, uh, why don't you jump in? <laughs> oh, all right, go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I wanted to, um, you know, like, like, uh, like others, I've also been very impressed by the, the, the more political turn that the World Bank has taken. Politics with a small p, let's say, recognition of power, a recognition of governance as a as a relationship between uh, you know actors with different levels of power, rather than a kind of bland institutional arrangement. So this has been this has really been uh, great progress, and I particularly liked your work on uh, on 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 citizen driven change or citizen participation in change because um, the organisation I work for, it's the Institute of Development Studies at Sussex. It's I should say, rarely get this opportunity to say, we are the best, the top ranking university in the world for development studies. We beat Harvard. I always have to say this in the US. <laughs> otherwise, <laughs> nobody knows who we are. We're, we beat Harvard again this year, and Oxford is somewhere down there, number three, but we're the top. But one of the things we do very, very well at IDS is we've always done very citizen, uh, citizen participation work on governance issues, on political issues, on development issues. It's really been a big theme for us for, for 50 or so years that we've been around. Um, and uh, I think we've been a thorn a little bit in the side of the of the World Bank World Development Report ever since the poverty report of when was that Nine, uh, 2000 uh, where they did the voices uh, voices of the poor work and we were pushing them from that time so very much bottom up approaches is, is very much what we are into and I'm a member of a group called the Power and Popular Politics Cluster and one of the things we're very interested in is this wave of informal politics uncivil society, I think you could think of it as, unruly politics that, that really started about 10 years ago. Um, and it's one of these reasons I started looking at these issues of the, the what we called then the food, fuel, and financial crisis. I think in this country we think of it very much as the global financial crisis. But before that, that was a huge, really massive global crisis of fuel prices and food prices. 
And before any of the occupies and austerity protests in Europe and the US, you had this massive wave of food riots and fuel riots in uh, something like almost 40 countries in the world. And this was a moment of great uncertainty and great unrest. It, there's no doubt about that, worldwide. 2007, 2008, 2009, you know, the G20 were getting together. Everyone was very, very anxious. All, all the global elites were very, very anxious. And um, I think the reason uh, Nick asked me to join this panel today is that we, s we started doing some work thinking about what the effects of these protests were. And originally, we started thinking about the media as a source of data for understanding what was going on. And as we continued with the work, we realized that the media were actually a very key actor in this process. And actually, only, only quite recently have I come to the conclusion that they played a really quite a constructive role, which I don't think anyone has really picked up on yet. And I wanted to say a couple of words about that. And I think the international media played quite a different role to the national media in these, in these cases. So we were studying what the international media was doing, talking about food riots, different kinds of protests, and how they were framing that, who was listening, and, and so on and so forth. And, um, and this is you know, very much, the, what, what did you call it? The legacy media, the print media and the broadcast media. Not so much, we weren't really so interested in social media, which 10 years ago even, I mean, you, know, you talk about rapid change, 10 years ago, you know, people, there were no WhatsApp groups or whatever they were now that, that we know pr p protesters use. But in those days, those didn't exist. But the international media, when we looked at the coverage of, of, the, of that moment, it did, it did three <coughs> quite important things. First, it, it, it framed these food riots all around the world as a wave. So you got the sense of all of these things going on in, you know, there were some in Somalia, there were some in Indonesia, there were some in Angola, wherever. But it was a wave. And so you got the sense that these things were not unconnected. There was a, a core, you know, connection. And this is the international media coverage showed us this. The second thing they did was they, they framed it very much as a dangerous issue, a matter of great danger. And this was in the news headlines of the time and, you know, it, it's the threat of the global crisis. It was a, it was a, it was a really uh, dangerous uh, situation where not only, not only, I mean, quite a few governments were toppled at this time. And I should say a lot of people have connected that pro those protests to what subsequently happened in, in, in the Middle East, the Arab uh, uprisings. Some people called it the Arab Spring. There was a connection. I wouldn't say it was a causal connection, but it was a trigger. There's no doubt, those food price issues. Um, so it was a very dangerous time. The third thing was it was a real kind of um, commentary on the failure of the global economy, if you like. So the international media did these three things and said essentially to the global policy and political elite, the IMFs and the World Banks and the UNs and the G20s, you know, you got to do something. And it really made, sent this message. Uh, the national media did a, quite a different job, actually, and looked much more closely at how, you know, protesters in Mozambique or wherever they were, wh why they were not only angry about not being able to afford to get the bus to work anymore, but also how they were connecting that to corruption and to uh, political issues that they, you know, authoritarianism, also to inequality. Um, and they also, they kind of set a kind of a, they kind of really put pressure on governments to act. And, and you know, both the global policy domain really shifted around the food issue in particular, but so did a lot of, a lot of national policy um, agendas moved on this. So your point about what happens when, you know, in the policy arena, uh, Marco, um, you know, very much the media played a role in setting, in helping set these agendas. And, you know, kind of three things really struck me about the role that the media played here. And this very much picks up on what you're saying, um, Tara, about the way in which the media has changed. And one is that, you know, rather than sitting there reflecting the reality of what was going out in the world, the international and national media played quite kind of formative roles in the politics of this time. And one thing was that they were quite, an it was quite analytical, they would, deter they would say, well, it's this kind of protest, not that kind of protest. They would kind of determine, they would categorize and classify and really do analysis, the kind of thing that researchers should have been doing, but researchers can't be there in time. You know, it's 20 years later and we'll get our journal articles out. But, you know, I mean, it really is, in my case, that is the case. Ten years later, I'm finally getting the book out on the food riot. <laughs> but, you know, the, the media is there on the spot telling the story and analyzing. So an analytical role is very much there. This is getting more and more important in a more globalized, more complex world. You know, who, who can understand things? Well, we, who's, who's going to understand big global shifts like this? Well, you need journalists who are going to be able to make this kind of, to look at these complex patterns and figure out, tell a story, tell a narrative that connects them all. So they did that. Another thing they did, which I think is very important, is they amplified the voices of people who had no voice. So in Mozambique, this was very striking. We looked at uh, what was happening there with the protesters. And there were all these civil society groups, very polite, very nice, 
sat around in nice hotel rooms with the donors and so on, and had no idea what was going on on the street. So what the media did was actually amplify the voice of the street in a way that civil society was entirely failing to do in Mozambique. And the other thing they did was, and this is very noticeable in India, in the right to food movement in India, they, they played a very activist role, not only in India and other countries as well. They were act acting like activists, getting involved with activists, again, very connected with what you're saying, um, you know, really supporting, um, supporting organizations, working with them, really setting a kind of a, a moral agenda, really, about what, about what this was, a kind of a rights-based, I would say, um, agenda about uh, what citizens' rights were and, and how governments should, should uh, respond. So, this, so in this way, I think, you know, there's a kind of an uncivil, a kind of unruly aspect to uh, the way in which the media works in development, which is quite powerful, which is not really captured by rules and, and formal arenas. It's about people struggling to get in. And because they're newsworthy and because they, they, they capture something maybe in the popular imagination, the media works very well with those sorts of struggles at times. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting and challenging agenda, I think. And I think we see more of this now. Anyway, I'll stop there. Fabulous. Did anybody want to jump in? I have another question, but let's have a bit of conversation around this. It's yeah, Sorry? yeah, please. Yeah. So, I played a heavy role in that, okay? Like, uh, the one bank used to do. <laughs> uh, so, we, mm, uh, I mean, this conversation is, is really exciting, and you're all pointing at the, um, at the, precisely the entry points that we're trying to emphasize in the reports, how media really bring new issues to the tables. They give information, so they change voting behavior, and so, in a sense, reducing information asymmetries, they, uh, change the incentives of elites and people inform behave differently. They also help uh, people to coordinate. You know, you mentioned the idea, you know, how, you know, the protest and uh, uh, so there is, a, there is a lot about the positive role. Um, in the media spotlight and throughout the report, we emphasize the fact that the media are themselves part of the political process that, under that uh, underlines development. So the um, and uh, people in power, I mean, what we call the elites in the report, we have the main actors defined as elites or citizens, and we define elites, those have direct influence over the policy decision-making process. Elites are not stupid, so in a sense, if you look at uh, around the world, um, billionaires tend to be involved in media, and uh, powerful actors try to control media, and they, they do that for a reason. And government try to control media, and there is an interesting research that shows that government ownership of the media affects the way that certain issues are or not broadcast. So in a sense, media can indeed be an actor, but they, you know, they don't develop in a vacuum. They, they, they develop themselves into a political market. If you understand the political market, you also understand sometimes the dark side that the media uh, can, can play. Um, we show, for example, in the report that uh, um, uh, there's an interesting paper in the case of Argentina that shows that uh, corruption scandals tend to be advertised by journals and media which were not owned or not associated with the government. And this is not surprising, but it was a very rigorous research that shows that. And um, equally, we, we broadcast, we, we, we mm, feature the, the famous case of Montesinos, the bloody videos in Peru. F in Peru, for 10 years, the media was the machine of the Fujimori regime. It was, uh, was the instrument through which the consensus was built. And how that instrument was working was working through uh, bribery. So, um, uh, and there's an interesting data here. And uh, if bribing a politician or, uh, or a judge was costing $10,000 a month, bribing by media channel was costing $1.5 million a month. So almost like 100 times higher. So that shows you like what, what is the, the role of the media and how important they are for the, for the powerful elites and why everybody can try to uh, get control over them. And in fact, the reason why eventually the regime collapsed, there are many reasons, but the media actually played a role because there was one, one television channel which could not be bright, and that was the channel that eventually uh, broadcasted the video showing the Montesinos bribing every single politician, and then the moral outrage uh, uh, allowed the oppositions to coordinate and basically uh, bring Fujinori down. So there is, a, there is a lot of things we should, we should think about, and uh, what we tend not to consider is the fact that the, 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 the media market is endogenous to the political process. So mm -hmm. thinking about how the media competition can be increased 
is uh, should be the focus of the yeah. conversation among the dogs. I, I Say that add. again. The media, the media market is endogenous. What so, in a sense, the media market, how media functions, is themselves uh, like a function of uh, that process yes. that happened in the, poli in the policy arena, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I who th have more interest, uh, who have more power to sh to make sure that certain interests are reflected, and certain messages are or not um, accessible by the citizens. So in a sense, they control not only who gets information, but also the information that you get. Let me, let me put it, I think, you know, this is, uh, Sima has been thinking about power in the media quite a bit. I mean, media is an actor. It wields its own power in some respects. It is a avenue of power uh, for others, but it is also, I think, a site of struggle. And, and that's why we talk about the governance being, you know, the governance of the media system as being so important is that uh, when there is a struggle for uh, control, if you will, of the media, uh, intervening at that site is actually crucially important for ensuring that um, other sectors of governance uh, are protected and strengthened. You know, it's, it's not just a microcosm, it's, you know, because it is interstitial, it's a microcosm with tentacles that, you know, reach out into other areas. Uh, and it seems like, you know, we've really been trying to push this idea that, um, you know, rather than just thinking of media as, uh, as another, as a capacity that you, that you build, thinking of it as a site of governance itself. And that governance is not determined only by the laws and regulations, no, not at all. It's determined by the capacity of civil society to, to understand and to protect that space, uh, champions inside of government, um, uh, working with the media to uh, basically defend the value uh, and the principles of this kind of deliberate, you know, protect, keeping this space open for democratic dialogue and deliberation. So, uh, you know, we really think that is very strategic space. Did you? Yeah. Something to say, yeah. I can just also underscore that point, both, uh, both points that uh, Marco and uh, Naomi were making. And um, uh, just to go into a slightly different direction, I think that social movements, uh, people who are protesting, people who are mobilized, civically should really take a note of some of the things that are being said here and particularly in, in a sense of the important role that media is playing and although i have not studied this extensively and and am about to write a book on on protests uh, there have been quite a few protests in the region that i cover uh, starting in 2014 and i hate to say this but unfortunately a lot of them have failed i think precisely because of this lack of recognition mm -hmm. that different these different elements uh, play in what you are what you were just describing, Nick, and media in particular. Mm -hmm. And just to give you an illustrative example of uh, a massive wave of protests in Bosnia in February of 2014, which were the most violent and most massive protests the country has seen in the post-war period, and uh, basically started when a group of uh, workers in the northeastern region, which w who were dis disenfranchised by botched privatizations, clashed with police, and then that sparked a nationwide uh, uh, wave of protests that was then joined by the veterans and the pensioners and the students and, and who not. And ended up in something, uh, a new type for, at least for the region, a new type of engagement, which were called the plenums, which used a lot of elements of the Occupy Wall Street movement. However, the crucial mistake, in my opinion, that the plenums made at the very beginning was to exclude elements of formal civil society, um, advocacy and, and think tank organizations, media, because they didn't feel comfortable, again, because they were afraid of the politicization, the, 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 the media were maybe too much of a power channel rather than in, uh, in an altern I mean, uh, you know, agent of change. And even political actors uh, who, as you were just uh, describing, I think you were saying, uh, friendly faces in the, in the governments and in political institutions, which are ultimately necessary for political change. And when the demands of these so-called plenums came out, it they were very difficult to implement in practice because first they were ill-informed by what the real policy-making process re is and looks like. Oftentimes they uh, were completely outside of the jurisdictions of what the governments can do and the time frame with it within which they can do them. And most importantly, they didn't really have a proper channel in first and foremost legacy media, which continues to be the, the most preferred channel in this region, even though the internet penetration is quite high, to convey these messages to, uh, of course, not just the other citizens, but those who are ultimately making the decisions. And I think some of a lot of the things that Naomi was saying are very important uh, for uh, social movements as such to, to take in and note 
that all of these different parts really have a role to play. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to make a really quick kind of, um, I don't know if it's a meta comment, but it's sort of a comment on the commentary, which was just <laughs> to, just, just to um, ask that we think uh, uh, really critically about how we're using the term media and what do we mean by that, sort of in, th in the wake of the last 20 years and what we know, like, yes, there is still legacy media, and in very rare situations, is it still acting exactly like it was 20 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think um, if we're trying to think, and it's not like everyone, of course, has to use our model, but but um, but to th but I would just encourage you to sort of broaden your thinking about what do you mean by media, and think about the broader information system. What, like, what are the what are the think tanks doing, or what are the civil society? What is the information they're producing that might be influencing it? And it's it's not this isolated thing anymore. So it's ju I'm just to conscious that with with our speech, we're kind of repeating again yeah. <laughs> what we've sort of moved away from. And I think it's maybe just a word in this, in, in this uncomfortable moment where we're in a moment of transition and we're, who knows what we'll end up being. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd like to, this has been really fascinating. Um, I'd, I'd like to, with a bit of the time we have left, move a little bit towards um, implementing some of this, some of these uh, really, um, th these great visions and ambitions for um, bringing people together and media, you know, serving as this, um, uh, as the glue or as the uh, the links between these different forms of citizen engagement, but um, I might uh, Tara, could you uh, can I start with you? And, and you know, I know this is early stages, but what is going forward? What does this look like on the ground for IREX? Uh, yeah. Can we go back to our yep, snapshot absolutely, yeah. slide? Oops, there it is. So the kind of thinking and implementation piece for IREX is the increasing opportunities, which means kind of legal and cultural freedoms and improving abilities, which would be s skills and, and talent. So, so these sort of two big categories. So that's what we're planning to do in order to get to, to this. And a lot of it we do do already. Um, some of it perhaps not quite so well articulated to ourselves or perhaps not quite so well um, um, thought intentionally ahead of time or integrated with the rest of our work. I can call out perhaps, um, there's actually several new elements here. Maybe I'll call out a few of them just to say, you know, what are some of the things that we're thinking about that we think um, will make a difference towards creating vibrant information. Um, the first one I'll mention is leverage power dynamics. And this actually dovetails very well with what you were saying about understanding unequal sy uh, systems of power. Like we know that pretty much any system we're going to be dealing with that we'll be implementing and intervening in will we'll be facing great inequalities of power. Um, so this is a commitment to take that on more consciously and to understand the actors and try to understand different types of incentives and how we might leverage incentives so that champions that might support vibrant information will be more supported. Um, or the potential spoilers might perhaps be diffused a bit. Um, and that would be through things like political economy analysis, through gender analysis, through sort of an upfront and also ongoing analysis of, of power. Um, another piece I'll emphasize is the strengthening relationships piece of things. Now this, um, this is something I would say IREX is actually really good at and has been really good at from our inception. We started out as an, uh, as an educa higher education exchange program, so really building relationships between U.S. institutions and then Soviet Union institutions. And I think we're still very good at it, but we um, almost took it for granted, I would say. So what I mean by this is, is really building trust across groups and across individuals that um, perhaps were even antagonistic beforehand. Um, really doing the best to try and get people to see commonalities and, and work together. And we believe that this and a lot of the kind of sort of softer skills are actually absolutely critical ingredients to having any of the technical stuff work. So in other in sort of blunter terms, like who cares if you train a million journalists if, if, you, know, if you don't do any of this softer stuff? Mm -hmm. Because it does not, it, from our experience, it doesn't work. Um, so it's a, a commitment to, to that piece of things. Um, and then the last one I'll talk about now is this, this idea of performance. Um, now in this category, I actually would put a, a lot of the things in there that you would traditionally associate with an IREX or another um, media development implementing organization. That is to say, training journalists, um, working on digital skills and digital tools, um, 
helping media outlets to get better at business, whether they're for profit or, or nonprofit. There's a whole long list of these kinds of things. But we've reframed it to think about performance as opposed to capacity building. And the idea there is, I think with the way that capacity is framed a lot of times, it's, it doesn't necessarily have an end, right? Capacity for what? And um, at IREX, we've put together um, a performance improvement guide for ourselves internally, but we're taking it on as well in the information and, and, and media practice so that when we're, when we're doing all these kind of skill and technical building things, it's with the idea that they will have, they will have outcomes and there will be impact and it can be measured. So it's an idea of overall performance. So these are some of the things that we're doing. And, and maybe just one quick mention about sort of the way in which we're doing or some of the core principles, which would be um, some of the soft skills like listening, right? The first thing that we do when we go anywhere is first we listen. We ask people to tell us their, what their issues are and we try and understand. And this is an ongoing process. So a lot of our, I do implementation and work as well, um, and a lot of what I hear are on our, from our folks on the ground is how they're adapting and changing to, to ongoing circumstances. And sometimes it doesn't look that pretty, um, but it's, it's the reality that seems to work better. Um, it's also a bigger commitment to knowledge gathering and sharing. Um, so it's not just to do research, but to do research that's really relevant to, to our work and we hope to others, and to figure out really how to make a better connection between what we're learning and what we're doing. <laughs> to more productive ends. Um, and the last piece is using a gender lens. So we're very committed to inclusion, and we've particularly commi um, committed to um, incorporating, looking at gender inequalities across all of our work. Great. Um, I, I know Marco has a, a, had something. Do, is it on this topic, or can it wait for uh, a, a minute? Did you? Um, I can wait. You're great. Yes. Um, so, Sticking on the topic of how we implement this vision of um, these, you know, building these networks uh, and you know helping media to support this um, the citizen engagement across silos, uh, Ivana, you've you know, can you mandate that these th as a donor, you know, from a donor's perspective, can you mandate that this stuff happens, or is there a strategic way of? Uh, catalyzing this kind of uh, work? Definitely. The yeah. answer to the first question is no. Mm. <laughs> One <laughs> should not mandate these things. And of course, my view is slightly different from Tara's because we are simply a donor and grant making organization, not an implementer. Uh, so I will speak from that perspective uh, alone. But a lot of the things that she says, I think, are evident also in the, in the way we approach some of these uh, building of these networks or coalitions, if you will. Um, so one way of doing that is to identify the groups that share a common vision and help them see that commonality. I think you use this phrase, Tara, uh, of seeing, seeing their commonalities and building trust with each other. And the role of a donor, in, in my opinion, and I think that this is a philosophy that Ned espouses throughout, is more of a convener. So uh, facilitating these uh, uh, opportunities to for these different er actors to get to know each other and to recognize the values that each of them can bring to the process, but definitely not force these partnerships and coalitions. I have to say that in the, the 12 years that I've been here in the region I cover, I've seen s too many calls for proposals that condition grant making <coughs> on the building of networks and coalitions or consortiums or what, what you will. And I do think that those things have to develop organically. They're, they require time to develop organically, far more time than one has <laughs> to develop a proposal for a donor. And then what you often end up with is that once these coalitions and partnerships are created, as the organizations start to n get to know each other and things don't work out, a donor should, if possible, have flexibility to make adjustments, mm -hmm. which is not often the case if, if, if the whole premise of the assistance was to build a firm coalition and a partnership at the very beginning. And so I think that this is uh, this approach in which this will be these partnerships themselves, in addition to the types of things that and the approaches that the uh, individual actors will be working on have to be driven organically and locally. Uh, here an important point is that this ownership should remain with the groups throughout. And I know that <coughs> not all donors can afford this, um, but for example, one very simple way and one that I've seen quite a bit, the uh, element that interferes with this is the branding strategies and this need for donors to promote themselves and their work rather than allowing the people that were meant to assist 
to retain the ownership of what they're doing. And I think that to the extent that it's possible, I always appeal to my colleagues <coughs> in the donor world to try to remove their brands and logos from um, these programs that they're supporting unless they're actually implementing them themselves because this really interferes with this ownership idea. And then finally, long-term support. I was mentioning that this triangle approach uh, that both the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and NED has been working on since 2007. And so that's, we're talking 10th year now. And <coughs> some of the results have been produced even earlier, but I think for real change, and I think everybody recognizes it, maybe not 200 years as Marco was <laughs> yeah. saying, but certainly a decade or more mm -hmm. is necessary in terms of this, uh, in terms of seeing real change. And that would be, I think, pro probably the last point I would make. Yeah. Uh, do you want to jump in, Marco? Uh, yes, yeah. Yes, something very quickly on the on this organic uh, versus uh, induced participation, which is indeed a terminology we use in the report, and I, you know, I agree entirely. I mean, we. Uh, I mean, summarizing the literature on the topic, we, we made the case in the last chapter, which is about international actors and processes, that change cannot be engineered from outside. So, I mean, this is, even if we make the case that building coalitions between citizens and, dif and different sectors of societies and uh, decision maker is historically uh, a key ingredient for, the, for successful change, uh, you know, you cannot engineer this from outside. So that, uh, that's very well taken. Um, you, I mean, that speaks about the case of, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, Ivana, the, the, the Arab Springs, right? And different outcomes that they can bring. You, if you look at the media that role that there was playing in the Arab Spring, then of course, you know, you can, you know, help coordinating protests and then so you can help spikes those protests. But then it's by no accident that in Tunisia was has been one of the most successful cases so far. And why is that? Because media was an actor and it was an ingredient of something else. It, they did not substitute collective action, but they were helping collective action. So, uh, so what they had in Tunisia was the ability of uh, workers' organizations, social grass organizations, which was historically strong, and women organizations. And they were using media uh, as an instrument, but they had collective actions themselves. So I guess the point is how this collective action can be promoted and sustained in the long term, and where collective action comes from, that should be the focus, because uh, of course this cannot be engineered and quick fix, but the extent to which media can or cannot uh, facilitate change is a factor of how well or effectively citizens can organize. And um, I have a point on that, but yeah, maybe... Yeah, yeah. Uh, like go ahead. Go can ahead. Yeah. I... Uh, so maybe one thing that... Um, because I indeed, if you look at the developing, the developing community, uh, there are some striking statistics. Only, is I think, 0.3 percent of the entire development assistance that the OECD uh, countries gives to uh, developing <coughs> countries goes to media support. So, I mean, there is definitely space for improvement. Uh, everybody will, you know, um, probably agree with that. The point is uh, uh, how that could be made and how that mm, can be made in a way that does not reinforce uh, existing power structures, existing power dynamics. One thing that we show, and that goes again to the idea that is a decade-long process and sometimes it even takes uh, more than decades, we show the case of um, an interest in starting in the case of U.S. In the 19th century U.S., most of the media were owned by, uh, um, by local uh, in powerful elites, right, in each of the states. And uh, in a sense, you know, that basically facilitated corruption because uh, there was a capture of the way that media were advertising certain information. The, the, the study shows that looking at ab about 100 years of history, what, uh, what facilitated the, uh, the development of independent media was the rise in the prices of the uh, advertising revenues. So in a sense, if advertising revenues uh, becomes uh, more valuable for the media owners, so in a sense, if uh, it's more expensive, also you get more money, you get access to a different revenues, and uh, you can be more independent from government uh, sources. So that tells a lot about the role that the private sector development can play. So by developing private sector, by you can uh, facilitate actors that can contribute to buying uh, media uh, spaces, and by buying media spaces and broadcasting uh, uh, opportunities, they can provide these different revenues. So again, it's an indirect process, takes decades, but uh, it helps us to change some power dynamics by supporting different actors. But unfortunately, I think, you know, that, that model of, you know, ad revenue based journalism is, uh, is failing obviously now. And one of the things that we're seeing is that, you know, th this opens the opportunity for uh, oligarchs, 
for elites connected to politicians to control media, not through the old fashioned ways of uh, control and censorship, but uh, by twisting the screws of what revenue is left, by, uh, by taking uh, ownership of, uh, of media outlets, something in Eastern Europe that is, uh, is, has been seen actually quite widely. Um, and, uh, and often through less than transparent means. Uh, so it's, you know, it seems like it's some Austrian holding company buying up uh, Hungary's uh, leading newspaper and no one really knows uh, who it is that's behind it. So the market has not been the bulwark against, you know, for independence that it used to be, unfortunately. And that really has added a wrinkle to, I think, our, our recipes for media development these days. But um, uh, you guys don't have any questions or anything, right? <laughs> 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 All right. So um, I, I have a question for you, Naomi, but uh, well, let's take a few questions from the audience yeah, and then we'll, we'll come back. Yeah. Uh, we have... Uh, a woman in the back row, this gentleman in the red tie, and uh, our, one of our fellows here in the middle. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. I was, um, I work in journalism for 10 years, and then I work with a nonprofit here in DC focused on integrity and governance. So I have very clear the two hats, and it's been, I'm actually starting a PhD now, focused on how they are crossing, right? The aspect of the transformative action that um, the IRX colleague mentioned, I think is something that is incredibly important. And I was wondering for all four panelists, to what extent do you feel that in this new context, the evaluation and the indicators that have been used to assess, you know, effectiveness of the investment or, you know, the, the results of media, um, you know, professional journalism versus the, this professional quality information that is coming out from NGOs and others, to what extent do you feel that you have the, the right evaluation models to determine that? I don't want to be dismissive of, of what is there, but at the same time, I think they're very, very limited. Um, you know, when you see um, evaluations that focus on the number of publications that were made, mm -hmm. or you know, what kind of results happen, even if they're just random. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Tara will be very, very happy to answer that <laughs> question. Right, this gentleman here. Yeah. I wanted to pick up and maybe pick up on your last comment about uh, the economics. I think you have to differentiate between you know what might be happening in Eastern Europe is quite different than in less developed places, and you find in Africa the media sector can be squeezed by government as the major advertiser and can decide not to mm -hmm. to d cough up that revenue, but it doesn't mean that therefore you turn away from the economic fundamentals of the sector. Rather, you have to get right the commercial side, because that's often the only thing that really is sustaining the media, is the ability to sell advertising to various companies. And that has to be a, a, an essential component of whatever the, the, the programming is. Now, having said that, I work at USAID. I'm not speaking on their behalf, but having been a journalist and a media trainer for a long time, I don't think the aid agencies themselves are capable of stipulating the degree of attention that's necessary to the economic fundamentals of the business, because you won't get a decent substantive story if the editor feels we're barely surviving and it's obligatory that the, you go off and cover this press conference and the composition of the news is a whole series of coverage of press conferences. So and so, so it's such and such important person said this yesterday. <laughs> That's the, the basic structure of things and implied in there, which rarely gets picked at, is a kind of status hierarchy about who's entitled to have something to say in society and what the media disturbs leaders so much is because it is somewhat not accepting the notion that you as president get to say everything and if anything the form of training and encouragement is how do you get the media to cultivate a regular for example a column by the head of the union federation commenting about economic policy that rarely happens and because there's a, a, a norm of the in the heads of the editors and a lot of other things that that's just not how you do things but if you want to figure out how to translate words on a page into civic activism that gets some traction you got to figure out a way to get away from a sort of unipolar status hierarchy in a country and get away get toward a place where there's a whole lot of voices that are that are that's the norm speaking so you get the catholic bishop to write something you get the unions you get the summit so mm -hmm. that once that becomes the norm you have more opportunities for cooperation between those players it's very difficult for a donor ever to have the insight because we're on our own little treadmill and trying to close the loop and get our stuff out the door and everything but i would I, 
to to the point about how do you demonstrate effectiveness, you have to bring those points into the the offering. And once you do so, and you, you point to it on the back end and say we did this, and here's why it worked, then you're more likely to get more business going forward. I think. Great. We had uh, one more question, and then we'll. Uh Hi, uh, thank you. Johnson Yuan, a fellow at National Endowment for Democracy. I would, look, I would like to share a bit of the experience of Hong Kong. So when we organized the Umbrella Movement back to 2014 and combined what we observed after uh, some, some of the survey, we found there were three phenomena during the movement. The first one was there were over half of the protesters who are newcomers to social movement and political actions, which means they are not tapping into any information flow or not very clear of the narrative or discourse or framing of media before the contentions. The second phenomenon is there were uh, decentralized information flow. 65% um, of them are constantly sharing news from media outlets. But at the same time, 35% of them are repeatedly generating content on their own, which means they uh, take photos of their protests, uh, they take videos, they express their opinions. And uh, the third phenomenon is uh, there is a uh, increasingly decentralized uh, momentum within the movement. And uh, a lot of the people, they shape their political opinion or perception of the movement through their friends, through their social circle, but not media outlet. And all this phenomenon cause one consequences, which is similar to Bosnia, uh, uh, Bonita, um, which is uh, there are increasing mistrust between individuals, protesters, and organizations. And uh, the reason for that is very obvious, because there were newcomers, there, were not, there isn't an uh, overwhelming uh, dominant framing in the movement. So what I would like to know is, is this some phenomenon that you also observe in your research and uh, what are the role of media outlet or traditional institution, institution like think tank or other information booker in those contention? And uh, what are the way and strategy to divert this synergy generated during the movement into a more positive way of dialogue within the movement and to like, uh, uh, improve uh, the chances of uh, people who are being politicalized to a more institutional politics. Thank you. I think Yvonne and Naomi, you might want to answer that. I think you both have some response to that last question. Uh, Tara, do you want to start with the first question, though, about uh, sure. the indices we have? Are they good enough? Maybe the second question. I think they're yeah, the sure. their comment um, about um, how do we know <laughs> how well we've done. Um, and I think you've, you've hit on something that really bedevils our, um, our small sector. And, um, and there's several levels at which to think about the question, too, right? So is, is one of it is evaluation of individual proje projects. And there's certain ways that we're required to evaluate by donors, and then other ways that we're, we use to evaluate um, in order to sort of feed in and help adapt. Um, some of those are better than others. You know, some of them are, are sort of the basics of, did the training actually happen? How many people were there at the training? Um, you know, these kinds of things. There's, um, we do, when, when we're working with content producers, that we do have measures of, of content according to journalistic standards, so we can use those. We have a tool we call the MCAT. Other organizations have other tools. So we try to measure content, but that we even have internal debates about what do we mean by quality content and how do we measure it, and um, if we haven't used this tool, can we still think about that? <laughs> um, uh, if you try and look at sort of broader level impacts, you can try and look at things like laws changed, passed, or implemented. Th that's also s tricky because how do you draw a line between what the implementer's done and what you've come out on the end? Um, on, a s on a more meta level, um, or more, I'd say, I should say, country level, um, IREX produces something called the Media Sustainability Index, um, which are the Leon Morse, my colleague here, is the, the longtime managing editor of it. And um, the way that works is to really, it's, it is used sometimes to evaluate individual projects, but, but in any case, it's a, it's a long-term look at um, 22 countries in Europe and Eurasia, and at, at times, depending on funding, other countries as well. 
Um, so that's an attempt to, it still uses actually those four pillars that I talked about at the beginning, like how we used to see the media sector, to see how is the media sector of a country performing according to these broad categories of journalistic professionalism and so forth. Um, now that we've kind of redone our approach and we're looking at vibrant information from a different perspective, we're also looking at the Media Sustainability Index, which may end up being called something else, um, to kind of realign it with these kinds of things. But in terms of the, the work we've been doing on that and the feedback we've been getting on from people, it's, it's very much what you've been saying. Like, how can you, where do you have the data, where is the evidence mm -hmm. to be able to, to answer these kinds of questions? So it's very much some that's like very much part of the the daily struggle, I would say. And um, I guess one more piece is that we're also um, beginning to invest a bit more in um, in in our impact as an organization. If, if we can't do it a countrywide, but but as an organization, how are we meeting certain indicators related to information and media? So we're collecting data across projects, um, and we're also looking at doing impact studies, which are it's pretty rare. Um, I think it's pretty rare in governance generally, but even rarer in, in media and information development. So looking, going back and looking after a project has closed and saying, you know, what can we say about, uh, about whether or not it's made an impact? And in a, the classical case, it would be you'd have the control group and the experimental group and doing a comparison. Um, we're also looking at some other kind of different ways of experimenting with that. But um, I'd say it's a sort of, it's a long ongoing dialogue. <laughs> You've hit upon a real challenging question there. Yeah. Yeah, Marco, did you? You want to say something first? I, I, I won't take either of the first two. Okay. Why don't you? Uh, you. Uh, were you going to answer the uh, the first question or the second question? Uh, both, both or less. Go ahead. Both of them. But I'll I'll leave you to answer first, or you want me to go first? Why don't you answer the second okay. question first? Okay. And then we'll Maybe. Go to the third well, question no. Maybe. I was um, uh, struck by the the, the the point that USAID gentleman made about the fact that, of course, we cannot engineer the economic foundations of the uh, the business, and uh, and indeed the the, the study that uh, that we feature, you know, look at hundred years, uh, so it's a it's a long term process to generate independent media, but if I can, uh, you know, leave us with a bit more hope, and uh, maybe referring, I don't know if you have that graph available, that visuals about again what how we can be a bit more creative as a donors and uh, and linking the dots that we usually don't and uh, using the media for a bit more than what the we usually think about them and uh, we uh, i mean we have this um, there's another spotlight in the in the, the WDR that looks about transparency and under what conditions transparency actually transparency and accountability initiative do have an impact for development. There's a lot of uh, debate on that. I mean, most of the times donors, I mean, we actually focus on making information available. So you you know you make everything transparent and you just assume that somebody else will do the rest of the job. And uh, we make the point that that by making information uh, by publicity itself, so make information. Uh, uh, accessible to people, and this is where the media is important, is a key ingredient for accountability. So it's not just to make them available, but ensuring that there is an actor that can use that information. And I'm saying this because in some, most of the times, for example, we help countries to strengthen transparency, and we help, for example, accountability institutions like the national audit offices, and uh, they publish reports, and sometimes the, you know they are credible sources of information, precisely because they receive a lot of technical assistance also from uh, side players and we don't do the extra steps of thinking you know, what other players can be bring brought into the dialogue once these reports are out and there are cases like l quite successful cases of countries where government themselves were quite creative in this sense uh, we have the case of Brazil for example that actually um, use the media to uh, systematically and so they, they as part of their anti-corruption uh, program in Brazil a few years back the the um, the central government wanted to monitor municipal government. So once the so national auditor office was auditing these uh, municipalities, and then as part of the anti-corruption program, they were given uh, subsidies so that uh, local media. So we are talking about small radios in uh, in, in rural areas and uh, local newspapers, I and mean, where they actually were available, could publicize the content of these audits. And uh, by making this information available, the result was that uh, there was, uh, as in the case of Kosovo, huge turn out and the uh, corrupt position well corrupt major was actually voted out so the point is that by by bringing at media and sometimes is radio and there's a lot of examples in in Africa looking at the 
role that radios in rural areas actually uh, played in uh, reducing these information asymmetries and making sure that transparency works. What, what is difficult is, again, to when you speak about media, to understand that they can either reshape preferences, so they can help people thinking in a new way about mm, the same things or uh, helping bring in new issues on the tables, or they can also um, simply amplify existing preferences and maybe uh, uh, magnify the polarization that exists in a country. So again, you need to bring them as an actor, but also the, the, the role that they play depends again on uh, whether or not they can be an actor of the politics or maybe reshape the political games. And uh, we have, in fact, another report in the World Bank, just released before the World Bank development report. I should uh, give a bit of recognition here, which is uh, produced by the DEC last year and is called Making Politics Works for Development, with big P in this case. And it's all about under what condition transparency can change voting behavior. And there's an entire chapter dedicated to the fact that media can actually uh, be an actor either by uh, increasing polarization, so just simply amplifying the preferences that people have, or being an instrument of public deliberation, so having a more long-term process through which people start thinking differently about things, and this is the uh, role of educational entertainment uh, that you were referring to. So again, they have a role to play, but media are not all the same, and they have a different effect. Great, Naomi and uh, Ivana, that third question seems to go to the heart of our issues here. Movements emerge, how do we you know, create synergies that make them um, impactful and lasting? I believe that's the essence of it. Yes, I thought it was, it's, a very, it's a very interesting question. The umbrella uh, movement um, really did feel like it sprung out of nowhere. And you know, these people hadn't had uh, you know, much experience of politics before. It wasn't out of nowhere. I think he helped lead it, actually. <laughs> 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 oh, I must talk to you <laughs> afterwards then. <laughs> no, it was such a very interesting, th it was such a very interesting phenomenon. But, um, you know, it, it struck me a bit when you were talking about the, the suspicion, the hostility to the mainstream media. I hate this phrase. We hear this all the time, the mainstream media. Um, and it, it, it was also true of much of the many of the occupies around the world. I think people here maybe think it was only in New York, but there were many occupies all around the world. And many of them were very hostile to the mainstream media. And this also goes to your point about the you know the polarization in the media of you know the the, the you know the, the tendency to you know give some important man a, a platform and to ignore all the many other voices. Of course, it creates a sense in which this is not a space in which our voices can be heard. How can we trust this or organization? But this issue of the suspicion of the uh, mainstream media, I think, is coming back in... I, I don't know how widely people are recognizing this, but I, I keep coming across this in my social life, in my social media. Um, the, the, the extent to which people I think are perfectly normal and mentally healthy are deeply embedded in extreme conspiracy theory thinking which they believe comes from something called the mainstream media. These are intelligent people with master's degrees from perfectly good schools. So I, I, really, I really worry about the suspicion of the, of the media and where it comes from is, is to me uh, completely alien. I, I don't understand it. But also as a, as a teacher, as a, a teacher of postgraduate students, I'm also very aware that people don't really have a kind of a critical filter that I, th I think that we were taught when I was young, you know, a hundred years ago. Uh, the, but you, people, you know, one source of information seems to be much as good as a, another source of information. I, I don't understand where that's coming from. And so I think the suspicion of the media is, is a problematic function of some kind of loss of sense of authority, legitimacy, loss of trust in, in formal institutions. But nonetheless, I think there's something very important about these, these, um, these experiences of mobilizing these social movements, the umbrella movement being one, they may have been new and they may have just been experiencing political activism for the first time, but, but those, ap those apprenticeships, that you, never, you never lose those experiences. They tell you a lot about what is possible, how to organize, and the next time they're struggling for democracy, they'll do it smarter, is my sense. Ivana, did you want to speak to that? and then briefly to, to the first question. I, I do think that this lack of trust that Naomi was talking about and that, that you mentioned as well extends beyond just media, but also to organize civil society. And I uh, actually have done some research on this, uh, which ended up in a short book called Mistakes Donors Make. I do think that we're largely at fault as donors because the approaches that we've employed, particularly early on in uh, developing civil society, have led to really 
removing civil, separating civil society from who their true constituencies, which are ultimately citizens. And you see this, I think, uh, most vividly when it comes to the social movements. I, I've certainly seen it in the last three years in the Balkans. And uh, rebuilding that trust is one of the key components. Uh, and it also actually comes with a little bit of distrust towards donors and the donor work in a particular country. And uh, I've often been asked uh, by people who were involved in social movements, how can you as a donor support the social movement? And I'll tell you right away, direct support is very difficult to do because there are accountability issues. And as a donor, we're often constrained to working with formally organized civil society groups or media groups. And but one way in which we could support as a, uh, civil social movements is what I was saying earlier, is that acting as a convener and a bil bridge builder and maybe a trust builder too between social movements that do, most likely, as Naomi was saying, lack experience in organizing, in policy making, in media outreach, with those who have it. Uh, and those often are the civil society groups. And of course, not all civil society groups are created equal. But if, uh, if you can uh, help to, sh to kind of sift through this um, very diverse field of civil society and media and think tanks and uh, uh, even political actors, and help to find partner or uh, design these partnerships and help the, civ the, uh, the social movement. And that might be one way of approaching it. And of course, I'm theorizing here because if I had the answer, then every social movement would be very successful. Uh, but I think that from what I've seen in, in, in the region um, that I cover, this, this has really been what's lacking. And very briefly on um, uh, measuring impact or evaluating impact, it is a, it's a constant struggle, absolutely, here at NET as well. But I think uh, for a very long time, and certainly for the last uh, 12 years that I've been here, because uh, our excellent management, uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, manager here at NET came at the same time as I did here, we've always really focused not on outcome, um, not, not, sorry, not on outputs, but on outcomes and impacts recognizing that this is a harder approach to evaluation. So while we still continue to use a lot of quantitative indic indicators to look at what impact, uh, whether media or civil society projects have had, we understand the limitations of those. Um, and then we, we really want to see what change actually happened. And that's really difficult, of course. First of all, th there are not that many changes that happen within a, grant, a year grant period, which is what our a grant period usually is. But also we have to recognize that uh, any change that happens happens in really, uh, uh, how would I say, in a, an environment that is shaped by many different elements, not just what we support as a donor, but all what other donors are supporting, what other organizations are doing, what are the political changes that are happening at the time. And so what we often do is maybe to answer a question more specifically is that we resort to anecdotal evidence. Uh, which of course is not, uh, doesn't indicate a larger change, but we often say here that having one concrete story of a change is better than having some general claims about changing a particular environment. So we often resort to anecdotal evidence in, uh, in, in telling stories like I did at the beginning of this, the triangle approach in basically how many mayors in this, uh, out of 38 municipalities in Kosovo have basically uh, implemented very specific policies uh, in the mandate that, that, um, that they were awarded of four years. They were direct result of being put on a, on a spot by their citizens in a town hall meeting. Uh, yeah. go, go, go ahead, I mean, we'll take another quick round yeah. of questions. Yeah. yeah. I mean, very quickly on the, on the, on the impact and uh, the evaluation, and of course, this is a difficult area, but uh, I, I really encourage those who are interested to look at the references in the, in especially in the media spotlight, because uh, oh, Mike. Oh. thanks. There is a growing uh, literature that actually use randomized control trials and very system mm, systematic and rigorous econometric to look at uh, something like the impact on uh, media in changing behavior in uh, affecting the uh, electoral outcomes. So, I mean, there is a growing literature on the fact that can show with quite some sort of confidence that media do play an important role, either on the positive side or the negative side. So, I mean, even you know, keeping in mind that we as donors, when you engage in projects, of course, you don't have the time to design uh, such rigorous research design. Academia has done quite a lot of uh, progress in the last 10 years, and these are somehow capturing the references. So I will uh, encourage you to look at some of them. Um, uh, if I have an opportunity, when, when we look at what we can do as a donors, and uh, 
I mean, indeed, I mean, if uh, if NET is constrained and engaging with civil society, you can imagine the constraints of the World Bank. So, in a sense, <laughs> as a donors, we uh, we've been criticized for a long time for the fact that you basically engage with uh, with executives and then with the uh, people uh, with the government. Uh, but at the same time, as an effect of this dialogue with civil society, I think we've come a long way from these traditional approaches, and we have instruments nowadays that actually been established with since quite a few years now, like the Global Partnership for Social Accountability, which is a platform through which uh, 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 money, grants, are given to civil society organizations to develop uh, interventions that are, you know, they have a relevance for developing outcomes that involve state and non-state actors. So the bank, in this case, plays a uh, like an honest broker roles, but there is also funding mechanisms through which civil societies can uh, implement initiatives. And what we have been trying to do as a as an ev as a part of the operationalization of the WDR to say what does it mean now for our work is to see if the design of these grants can be informed by some of the messages in a way that when you give grants to, to these civil societies you might make sure that the kind of initiatives take uh, stock of the of the w evidence from the literature. So, for example, bringing media in the way that they engage in the monitoring of the civil services and using ICT solutions in a way that mm, has been proved to be more or less effective. So, um, there is space for engagement and, uh, and, and I think this is something that we can all uh, agree should be reinforced as part of the moving forward agenda of the donor engagement what with was media. The what was the name of that uh, facility? The Global Partnership for Social Accountability. It's right. been established in 2012 and uh, it's, a, it's a pool of funding, so it's a trans fund that the bank manages with funding from different donors including USAID. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a new channel th through which bank for the first time can give direct funding to non-state yeah, actors. It would be, be great to see more media support coming uh, right. out, of, out of that fund. That would be terrific. Great. Um, we'll say one more round of questions. I had one really quick comment in response to this gentleman from the USAID. I, I didn't mean to diminish the role of business models. And in fact, on the contrary, we're very interested in SEMA at finding those business models. What, what I would say is that the, the landscape is really uneven. There's profitability in some countries and not in others. And even within a single market, you know, there may be uh, broadcast might be very profitable and newspapers might be uh, in serious trouble. And actually understanding that unevenness is really what's critical for media development to be effective and to give two examples, nonprofits may, if they can see that channeling that newspapers need their money more than anything, you know, these kinds of nonprofits such as uh, Bill and Melinda Gates that are supporting journalism directly, you know, they could be of greater assistance there. But likewise, you know, in the broader context of citizen engagement, I think if, if these kinds of broader governance partners understand that media, eco media ecosystem and see that the investigative journalism, which formerly used to come out of newspapers, is shriveling, that they may have to take up the slack in, in environments where that's simply not profitable. And in areas where it is profitable, great, let's get private investment in there to shore up that work, but that's not always going to be the case, and especially in digitizing markets. Anyways, we're, we're really involved in that kind of work, and we think it's really a piece of this puzzle that uh, it fits actually into this larger puzzle. Uh, so, uh, yeah, a uh, quick round of questions. This gentleman had his hand up. Mark, uh, any others? And then and, and one more. And also one thing, we have 10 minutes, so keep them very brief. Ivana has to run literally in 10 minutes. If you have any comments also for how to move this forward, any great suggestions for bringing this together, let's hear them. Oh, well, we have now one in the back. A great suggestion for bringing it together. All right. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, Will Ferrajaro, consultant to PSEC Lab and others. I just had a question. It seems like we're talking about systemic changes in the media sector and responses uh, to that. But we, we haven't been explicit about the closure of civic space. And, and I wondered if you could speak a little more about that direct impact. Obviously, the holistic approaches that some of you are discussing would res be one response to that direct and overt action by governments. Uh, but I wondered if you could speak a little more explicitly about that. That's a good question. Uh, Mark? I just wanted to... Um, Ask a question from, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Um, Marco and, and others too, but uh, especially Marco, it, one of the things that, um, in fact, uh, Tara and I did some work together back when I was at the World Bank, um, looking at the way donors behave in the role of the World Bank in governance reforms and in the broader 
engagement with civil society and, and these kinds of questions we've been dealing with today that basically came to the conclusion that the bank's most important role of all is acting as a way of, of pulling different actors together around a common set of outcomes that, uh, that might be defined at the country level and, and using different players more strategically. And I, I still think we have a long way to go from that. I think this report uh, lays the groundwork for making the case for doing that. Um, but it may, it, this, this report may have less impact on the way the bank behaves than on the way it should, uh, in terms of its own projects, than the way it should behave as a convener of development actors uh, around the world. Uh, there, we, there, we, we've got all these big players like IRX and Internews and uh, you know, USAID and all these other people that are doing the kinds of things that are really necessary for, um, for building sustainable media systems. It's woefully underfunded. It's woefully badly integrated into the overall governance agenda of countries. It's badly owned by the countries and the uh, governments that, uh, that have to deal with these things. And I just wonder if you think this, this could spur the bank to play a little bit more constructive role in trying to make that happen in, in, uh, around the world. Great. Uh, so on the closing of civil space, is that, do, do you want to say a word before you maybe have to run off? Yeah. I just want to clarify that I'm running off to catch a plane. It's not like <laughs> I'm <laughs> eager to leave the stage. Certainly not. <laughs> I mean, after having this wonderful conversation. Yes, I think uh, I would extend it, closing of civic and media space. And, and we've certainly seen it in the, in the region uh, that I've been working on. And uh, uh, increasingly so, which is something that I don't think none of us expected, we're back in the role of leveling the playing field. Because uh, there was a hope, just like there was a hope for media uh, to become sustainable through advertising and marketing and the business plans uh, years back, like a decade or, or so ago, there was also hope that civil society is going to be able to uh, continue doing the work uh, that, they, that the, it has been doing without as much international donor support because it will be the governments that will be stepping in, it will be the private sector that will be stepping in, it will be the citizens that will be stepping in to, uh, to provide uh, both uh, financial but also other kinds of support and that has not been the case and certainly one part of that is economic because uh, particularly after the 2008 crisis which I'm going to think of differently now <laughs> after Naomi's speech um, that's been difficult to generate some of those uh, resources certainly from the private uh, sector and, and uh, from private citizens but the governments have certainly shown that they're not quite in the mood to support some of the initiatives that we've outlined here especially if they have a watchdog role to play um, and uh, and what we're increasingly seeing now is that the uh, i mean in a term that i think is now known to everybody of democratic backsliding is that we're going in a quite the opposite direction mm -hmm. and unfortunately uh i guess that we're not going to get out of business as soon as we had hoped and uh i mean speaking of the donor side and that we're we're basically back in full force and uh and this is why it's encouraging in particular to see some of this reinvention of uh, of approaches in tackling these new challenges because uh it is certainly a trend that we're seeing everywhere even in potential EU member countries, which is the area that, that, I, uh, that I cover. Okay. So just another short thing um, about closing space. So we do work in closing spaces, um, and it's, it's, I think, partially why we needed this broader model, right, is so that we can't, it, it, if you can't work with a whole media sector, what do you do? Do you just take a piece of it? Do you, uh, you know, so it, we need to have something more flexible, and that might mean working you know, again, with the citizens directly, it might be mean working with libraries. It might mean um, just, but trying to find a way and an entry point towards this end goal of vibrant information, but not necessarily, um, not necessarily through a media sector approach. So I think that's that's absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, anything yeah just on the that? on the closure of the civic space again. Uh, the the country I work most on in uh, Bangladesh, um, and we've had a a, a definite. Uh, closure there um, from really quite vibrant media and civil society space to a really quite controlled one in the last five years or so but it has it has I think had um, some quite unexpected effects I mean there is some kind of creativity in the in the space you know there are people respond in different ways social media has emerged in different ways uh, people activists find new ways of getting their story out there so it's it's interesting to watch of course the long-term prospect is a bit 
grim. But nevertheless, in the short term, you do see this kind of resistance, which is interesting and fruitful, potentially, I think. So on the um, say something on the me on the shrinking civic space because it's something that we give uh, in fact uh, we give some sort of uh, empirical evidence in the report and in this case we use the uh, you know it's something that is also hard to measure right when you s speak about shrinking civic space there's a lot of country level studies and then you have to point a, sing a single government so it was also difficult for us to have this kind of conversation and understand whether or not there is a global trend and uh, we use uh, uh, a data set that has been uh, released uh, in fact a couple of years ago and now they just released the 2017 uh, 2016 uh, data and for those of you who don't know is a great source of information on uh, uh, media, CSO related uh, uh, um, uh, engagements and, uh, and, and basically is the largest source for political scientists. It's the Variety of Democracy uh, project, you know, there's a Variety of Democracy Institute in the University of Gothenburg that we partner with them, we, we commission some background papers and they measure, I mean, is a some is a it's, it's fantastic, something like uh, 70 million data points. So they cover 177 countries and uh, starting from the, um, um, 1900 up to today. So you can see on uh, indicators such as media censorship by the government, you know, how that, uh, um, that measure moved over the past 100 years. And so what you can see if you look at the global average of like media censorship uh, and uh, CSO, the, the, uh, the facility through which CSO can actually enter into the market, register and function, they measure this kind of things. And you can look at the methodology if you're interested. And uh, you c we, we show in the report there was a huge trend of like opening space, which uh, of course uh, mirrors the democratization process of the last 40 years. And indeed, globally, you see that the trend is reversing in the past six, seven years. So there is a shrinking and there is it is a global de de uh, phenomenon. Even if you control by income level, the trend is consistent. So this is not there is some regional effects, but it's also global by large standards. And w the point we make is that it's important for us to understand this, these trends because they, of course, this kind of operating environment um, uh, influence the ability of citizens to use this kind of channels that we were referring to uh, before, right? So the ability to use social organizations or political organizations or spaces of public deliberations is a way to effectively engage with the authorities and and promote change depend, of course, on the rules of the games. And the rules of the games are themselves, again, function of this, uh, mm. this uh, policy uh, um, arena game. So again, it's something that we give emphasis in the report, especially for the implication that this uh, might have for citizens to combine these different channels and th thereby promote change. Um, on the questions that Mark uh, raised, which are very tough questions, but uh, I, I think that is a uh, <sighs> Again, there's something. There's a lot to say about that, uh, and uh, the bank is not only the bank has to consider one element that we show in the report, which is the fact that aid as a source of income is become less and less relevant as countries move in their stage of development. There is a, an interesting graph in the last chapter showing that uh, the percentage of aid is very, of course, is very important as a as a percentage of the national budget for lower income countries and then you know if you move to the upper level income you become mm, less and less relevant through that channels so the point is how to influence change is precisely to rethink and uh, think about the role that the bank can have as honest broker couldn't agree more and in fact there was a discussion at the board when the when the um, when the report was presented to the board of uh, directors and uh, uh, I mean this is public information now and the president of the bank made very clear that uh, uh, the, the, um, the role of this report is not necessary to please everybody because you, you put on the, on the table things that are contested and issues that are still sensitive but it's precisely to invest in the knowledge uh, in, an, in, the, in the role of the bank as producer of knowledge, as an honest broker that can provide evidence and facilitate the debate based on evidence. And the point is that if, if the institution does not invest in generating new knowledge, the institution will uh, I, no longer exist on the long term. So in a sense, there is, uh, I suppose, at the higher level, at the highest level, a recognition that influence happens through different channels and using knowledge and uh, and uh, rigorous uh, information can definitely help the dialogue and this can be one way to engage so agreed entirely mm. 
Right. <laughs> Sounds like the WDR is as much of an internal advocacy tool as it is uh, an external advocacy tool. <laughs> All right, uh, I think with that we can conclude. Uh, look, this has been really fascinating. The, 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 I think the, the real conclusion and takeaway from this is that um, bringing folks together from governance, media development, uh, civic engagement, democratization, is, uh, generates a fascinating, uh, energizing discussion uh, with lots of possibilities. Now, we didn't quite uh, solve the problem of the international aid architecture uh, or, you know, or how to construct projects around, uh, you know, in this holistic manner, but I think it's obvious that um, if we start moving in this direction, there will be a lot of really exciting possibilities. So uh, we, hope, uh, we hope others will uh, continue to, um, f you know, encourage this dialogue and this cooperation and thanks for coming. <laughs>